Okay, so we just talked about uh, the first of seven moves is the move uh, from church models to Christ model. That, that Christ model is our conviction that we are following. We're doing ministry the way Jesus did it, all right? So the second move, and this is in your uh, session two handouts, and that is a move from decisions to disciples, a move from decisions uh, to disciples. I remember uh, going golfing. I'm really not a very good golfer at all. I don't golf very much, but I went this one time with this friend of mine who was a CEO of a, uh, uh, a hospital, large hospital, and I was talking to him about ministry and kind of what I was thinking about and issues we were dealing with and whatnot. I'll never, I'll never forget, he walked up, he put his ball on the tee, and he was getting ready to tee off, and he's listening to me talk, and he finally just stopped before he took his swing, and he said, Craig, you just need to decide what is success, and then do what leads to success. Bop! You know, hits the ball and moves on down. And so it got me thinking, okay, well, so what is success? If you're as successful as a salesman, then success is more sales, Right? If you're success in a business, it's more revenue. If you're success as a coach, it's more wins. Uh, if you're success as a principal, then it's more kids that graduate from your school. But it, if you're successful as a pastor, what is success? Some people say, well, success is if your church gets bigger. That's success. Or some say if you write books or if you're on, you know, if you get some kind of denominational uh, position, then you're successful. Uh, or if you have a certain number of baptisms or whatnot. Uh, I think there are a lot of definitions of success. But, but what did, how would Jesus define success in a, in, in a church? What would he define as success? If you go to Israel, if you go with me to Israel, which we, we go just about every year. If you want to come with me, we'd love for you to come and join me there. If you go with me to Israel, we take you to a place called Mount Arbel. Mount Arbel is the highest peak on the Sea of Galilee. It has a very pronounced profile. It kind of goes up and then cuts straight down uh, Mount Arbel. Now, if you look to the north of Mount Arbel, then you can see Mount Hermon, which is the highest peak in Israel. Really, the source of the Jordan River is Mount Hermon. They actually have a ski lift up on top of Mount Hermon. You can look over into Syria from there. If you look to the uh, east from Mount Arbel, then you'd see the tabletop basalmic rock of the, Go hi uh, the uh, highland, uh, Golan Heights. <laughs> not the Golan, no, I'm not sure what I was trying to say. The Golan Heights. I'm a public speaker. The Golan Heights. Uh, and then on the other side of that is Jordan, right? If you look to the south, then you would look to kind of the patchwork quilt of the Jezreel Valley. You would see the hills of Samaria, and eventually it would lead all the way up to Jerusalem. If you look to the west from Mount Arbel, if you're on a clear day, you could see two uh, towers that are part of an electrical plant that's right there next to ancient Caesarea Maritima, where the Apostle Paul was in, imprisoned there and left there to go to Rome. And so really from Mount Arbel, you can see all of that literally nations around you. And many people believe this is a place where Jesus gave the Great Commission. For a lot of reasons, number one, he said, go to the mountain in Galilee. Well, this is the highest mountain in Galilee. Another reason why they think it is because right along the side of Mount Arbel is the Trail of Doves. And the Trail of Doves connects Capernaum to Nazareth. So Jesus would have traveled that route multiple times. It would have surely probably gone on top of Mount Arbel. It's a beautiful view of the lake. And uh, maybe, you know, we don't know. There's no sign that said Jesus was here, okay? But maybe it's possibly the place where Jesus gave the Great Commission. And this is what he said in that Great Commission. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. To the end of the age. Buried in that statement, what we call the Great Commission, is, I believe, Jesus' definition of success. That he told us to do one thing. There's one imperative there. There's one command. We call it the divine imperative. 
And that divine imperative is to make, what does it say? Make disciples, right? Make disciples. That is the divine imperative. The, the Greek word is methetes. The Hebrew equivalent would be the Talmud or Talmudim in the plural. Both of these words mean uh, to, be, uh, to be a learner, okay, a learner. That's what methetes means, a disciple, a learner. Uh, it is the word that Jesus used multiple, multiple times and is, it is multiple, uh, repeated multiple times in the Gospels. Um, he didn't say here, necessarily go and build the church. In fact, Jesus said, I will build my church. It's his job. Our job is to do what? Make disciples. Now, if we make disciples, then he will be faithful to his part, which is to build his church. He, he didn't necessarily say go feed the poor. He didn't necessarily say go uh, do benevolent acts or build buildings, even though I'm not saying that those things are bad. But you can do all those things and not make disciples. And unfortunately, we have a lot of churches that are doing a lot of good, good things. I'm not saying any of it's bad, but are doing everything but the very thing that I believe Jesus commanded us to do. And, and, and I'm telling you, what motivates me as a pastor is the fact that I'm going to need to give an account for did I do what Jesus told me to do? Did I, did I make disciples? Did I lead a church that would make disciples? And so in all of our efforts to grow churches, we can miss the very thing that Jesus called us to do. So this making disciples is really, really, really important. Disciple making, by the way, did not begin with Jesus. I used to think that Jesus is kind of the guy that started this idea of making disciples. Actually, disciple making is rooted in the Old Testament. You see disciples all the way uh, back in the Old Testament. You go back to the story, if we had time, we could go back to the story of Elijah and Elisha first. Kings 19, right? And then uh, Elijah is told to find Elisha. And so he goes and throws his mantle over his shoulders and he knows what that means. And so he, he, uh, he, he breaks up his plows and has a big barbecue and a celebration. And then off he goes and Eli Elisha follows Elijah. And what does he do? Well, he's, he's learning to do what Elijah does. Whatever the prophet does, that's what he's learning to do. He teaches like Elijah. He prays like Elijah. He, he he, he does miracles like Elijah. And then at the end, when Elijah says, it's time for me to go, you need to leave me alone. The Lord's calling me home. He said, no, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to leave you. He says, no, go back. He says, I can't go back and leave you. And finally, he says, I just want the double portion of your spirit. He said, well, that's not mine to give. But if you see the, if you see the chariot come, if you see the Lord come to get me, then, then you can have it. And so then, of course, you see the fiery chariot coming down out of heaven, takes Elijah up to heaven, and the mantle falls down. I kind of envision it smoking, right? You know, Elijah was a man on fire. He preached on fire. He called fire down from heaven to Mount Carmel. He goes up in a fiery chair. He's, he's a prophet of fire, right? I just imagine that mantle smoking. He picks it up, Elijah, Elisha does, and he, and he takes it to the Jordan River, and he hits the Jordan River, and the, remember the river divides, and he walks over on dry ground, and uh, the prophets come to him, and they say the same spirit that was in Elijah is now in Elisha. And what is Elisha going to do? He goes on to carry on the work that Elijah did and to do great miracles and to do wonderful things just as his master had done. In other words, here, here's what was happening. In the Old Testament, you, making a disciple or being a disciple meant following a master so as to become like that master and carry on the work. That is, in essence, what a disciple was. Following a master as to become like the master and carry on the work. Now, you have all kinds of, if I had more time, I could talk about all different kinds of disciples that were happening in the life of Christ. There were disciples of, of Moses. There were disciples of the Pharisees. There were disciples of John, right? The disciple making was kind of the, the uh, typical way that you raised up an apprentice to carry on that work. We still have it today. There are disciples that in, in carpentry. There's disciples in electricity. You know, to be an electrician, a master electrician, you got to follow plumbing, uh, you know, financial world. There's, you go through this apprenticing model. That's the disciple-making model. 
So when Jesus talked about making disciples, what we talked about is calling people into a relationship with him so that they might be like him and to carry on the work of Jesus, to carry on the same mission that Jesus began, all right? So the end product, so it's more than just a learner is my point. My point is that disciple is more than just a learner. If you clearly just do a cursory study, Google disciple, you know, in your Bible software, and you can find that there are a lot of things that classify a disciple other than just a learner. And so as we kind of looked at, okay, what, what is a disciple? I'll just tell you how our church has worked through this. I really encourage you to do this on your own, to begin to do your own study of what a disciple, what are the times the word disciple is used? 28 times in the book of Acts, over 230 times in the gospels. When are the times that the word disciple is used? And how would you characterize a disciple? How would, what makes a disciple? What are the earmarks of a disciple? What is the definition of a disciple? Because listen, if you're supposed to make one, then you ought to know what, what you're trying to make, right? How in the world would you make a disciple if you don't know how to define it? And yet there are many, many pastors that do not know how to define a disciple. Let me tell you, I was in a conference, or a small meeting. It was about 15 of us in this meeting. And these guys were national speakers that have written extensively on disciple making. If I called out their names, you would know them. And I don't even know why I was in that meeting. I felt like a little kid that had been invited to the adult table. All right. And so I'm at this meeting and the, and the question comes up is how you define a disciple. And all of a sudden one guy says something, another guy says something else. And then it, then it starts to get a little tense and then there's, there's a little edge to it. And I mean, they're starting to really get after this discussion about, now these are national leaders that write on it and they can't all agree on what a disciple is. And I remember Bill Hull was in that meeting. Bill stood up, he quieted the crowd. And he said, gentlemen, we're using the same words, but we're speaking a different language. And there are many pastors and churches, they use, you make disciples? Oh yeah, I make disciples. We're using the same word, but are we, is our language the same? Are we, are we meaning the same thing by it? So it's really, the first step is Jesus' model is important. The second step is to define what a disciple is. If you can't define it, then you can't make it, all right? Uh, and so we wrestled with, was it, so I'm going to give you our definition of disciple um, that we have come up with. You, you're going to need to do your own homework. And uh, in fact, I'm going to ask you in a minute to critique this definition and you can make it better and then forward it to me. We'll, we'll work on it all together, okay? The first one is, I'm, we call this a 3D disciple. When you think of something as 3D, three, three-dimensional, fully developed, fully formed. So this is a description of a fully mature disciple, okay? 3Ds, right? You can tell it's made but written by a preacher because it's alliterated 3Ds, right? It's three means it was fully inspired by the Holy Spirit, right? That's <laughs> how you know a good sermon. Three, I was waiting for an amen. Amen. There you go. So the first one is devoted. Is this person devoted to Christ? Now, what I mean by that is that this person has come to confess Jesus as Lord. If we confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Romans uh, 10, 9. So, you know, this idea of being born again, Jesus used the term born again. You can't. You can't grow until you're born first physically, and you can't grow as a disciple until you're born first spiritually, and that means that there is a time when you were born again. In the New Testament, the word disciple is synonymous for a believer, and I think Micah was talking about that a little early, right at the very top of uh, our time together, that to be a believer is to be a disciple. In Acts 4.31, those who believed are the same people later on in Acts chapter 6, verse 2, that were called disciples. So believers and disciples are synonymous. Uh, later on in Acts 11, these believers that are called disciples also pick up another name, and they're called Christians. Which, by the way, though, the word Christian is only used a couple of times in, in the biblical material. Disciple is used multiple, multiple times. Now, what happens is the word disciple begins to kind of phase out in the epistles. Like 230 times in the Gospels, 28 times in the book of Acts. But when you get into the, God, in the epistles, that, that term begins to be 
uh, replaced by other terms like brother and sister or saint or believer or Christian. So you have other words that mean the same thing, but all of them for sure mean that this person is born again, that they're devoted to Christ. So the first thing you ask, is this person a disciple? You ask, are they saved? Have they given their life to Christ? Have they heard the gospel, repented of their sin, and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Devoted. Second thing is that they're, they're devoted to Jesus. Second is that they're developing. And I'm going to say developing in two areas. In character and in competency. All right? They're, they're devoted to Jesus and they are developing to look like Jesus in both the character and the competencies of Christ. Now, what do I mean by character and competency? Character is pretty obvious. The character of Christ, think of uh, uh, Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. There's a, there's a great place to start for the character of Jesus. Character is what's on the inside, right? Who you are on the inside, internal transformation, Christ-likeness on the inside. Philippians chapter 2, verse 4 says, have this mind in you, which is like Christ Jesus. The word mind there is, can be translated attitude. Right? Have the attitude, have the internal character like Jesus. And so <clears throat> when you talk about character, you're talking about internal transformation. But so are they developing in these characters? Are there, there's more joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Is that being born out in them? They're beginning to turn away from their old sinful habits and <laughs> begin to have a pursue uh, a, a desire for Jesus. That's internal character stuff. Competencies, however are more what you see on the outside. Competencies are, are things that you master, uh, disciplines that you master. For example, when you think about uh, competencies, uh, a surgeon cannot fully be accredited to do surgery until he or she has mastered certain competencies for surgery, right? A, a, a builder cannot go build a house until he's mastered some competencies in building. There are, there are many, multiple jobs that require you to master certain competencies. They have boards and they have tests and they have all these things. Your lawyer's got to pass the bar. You've got to do certain things to show that you've mastered this competency before you go out to do it. Well, in the same way, when Jesus was training his disciples, he wanted to, them to master certain competencies that allowed them to multiply. There are certain competencies they had to master in order to multiply. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about what those competencies are. But I believe these competencies can be summarized into three big buckets. Okay? You could probably go through a list and probably come up with a whole list of 50 or more. I'm just, for simplicity's sake, I'm going to give you three big buckets. The first bucket is that they know how to walk with God. Right? They know how to walk with God. So that talks about prayer, the word, uh, confession, uh, hearing the Lord, uh, dealing with temptation. Jesus trained his men on how to walk with God. Some overtly by teaching them, this is how you pray. We have two recorded accounts, but one at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, one at the end of Jesus' ministry, where he taught them how to pray, right? Uh, but then there are some that he taught just by virtue of his example. And I'm sure we don't have recorded all the conversation they're having along the way between towns and villages, right? I'm sure there's a lot there that's happening that we just don't have the benefit of seeing. But how to walk with God. Number two, he taught them how to reach their world. So he taught them how to share the gospel. Of course, modeling for them with the woman at the well, modeling for them with the Gadarean demoniac, modeling for them the conversation with Nicodemus, both insiders and outsiders, people that are on the fringe, people at the core center of Judaism, uh, both skeptics and believers alike. He showed them how to share the gospel effectively. And he sent them out to do that. That's why I believe I'm, I've referenced it earlier in Acts where it says, the, it's obviously he's been a been with Jesus because they talk just like him. They act just like him. They do what he does. But we got rid of one and now we got 12. They look just like him. The third thing, the third competency is how to invest in a few. I believe that Jesus, through his training process, which I'll get to in just a minute, trained them on how to invest in a few 
so that they could reproduce their lives in the lives of others. So the question is, all right, are a disciple, are they devoted to Jesus? Have they given their lives to Christ? Are they developing in the character and competencies of Jesus? Do they know how to read their Bible? Do they know how to, uh, do they know how to feed themselves spiritually? Do they know how to pray? Do they know how to share their faith, share their testimony? Do they uh, know how to deal with temptation? Are they pushing away some things they used to do from their past and beginning to have a, uh, the practice of gathering in community? Are they living in community? These kinds of things begin to reveal to us the maturity of that disciple. Does that make sense? The third, third characteristic, devoted Jesus, developing the character competency of Jesus, and finally deployed into the mission of Jesus. So they are now engaged in the mission. They're engaged in the ministry. You know, when you, when you talk to a, a, someone who served in the military, anybody here served in the military? Raise your hand. All right, thank you all for your service. You know what deployed means. Deployed means you leave the comfort of home and you go to where the fight is. And when we talk about deploy, this person is deployed in the mission field or in the ministry of Jesus, what we're saying is that this person is actually engaging in some way in the ministry of Jesus, that they are sharing their faith where they live, learn, work, and play, that they are discipling another person, they're engaged in ministry, just like Cliff that I was telling you about that gave his life to Christ, and now he's on the mission field, and he's sharing the gospel at home. He's deployed in the mission. He's doing the work. Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest that he may send forth laborers. Where are these laborers? Into the harvest field, right? Harvest field is all the places where people are lost. And God wants to get them out into the harvest field, right? So ultimately, what we would define a disciple is someone that's like this, the, you know, a, a Fully ordered, mature disciple is that they are devoted, they've come to Christ, they're growing in these areas of character, they've mastered some basic competencies, and they are actively engaged in serving Jesus in the mission field, okay? Now, are they perfect? No. Even the Apostle Paul said, I have not attained it yet, but I press on, right? I forget what's behind, I press on to what's ahead. So none of us are going to arrive at perfection until we get to glory, Right? We're all in process, but this is a, allows us some way to measure, is this person a fully grown disciple? And if not, which one of these areas do they need work? Which one of these areas do we need to help develop them in? Now, listen, uh, I talked about the transition is from decisions to disciples. <clears throat> and, and what I mean by that is that many times as churches, we focus so much on making decisions that we don't focus much on making disciples. We, we, we have a lot of programming and focused on decision, ma decision making and not necessarily making disciples. I, at the church that I'm at now, several years ago, we had a big event. We spent an enormous amount of money on this event. It drew, you know, several thousands of people, um, which is great. Uh, we actually had, uh, I think, a couple of hundred people that prayed to receive Christ. But when we went back to do all the follow-up on all these people that had made decisions, you know how many of those people were willing to be baptized and to go on growing in their faith? You know how many? Out of about 200, how many? Zero. Zero. So... We said, well, maybe that's just an anomaly. Let's try it one more time. So we did the same thing. We did a big event. You got in the paper. Everything looks great. You know, we get written up by the denomination. A couple hundred people come to Christ, follow up. Zero. And we're like, okay, something's wrong here, right? Because these people are truly born again, right? There's going to be something in them like, okay, I'm ready to take another step and... Uh, Needless to say, it caused us to really go back and reevaluate how we did outreach events to begin with. Um, 
I think if you, many times it's easy to focus on decisions and not disciples, right? Let me give you just a couple of things. I'm not sure if these are in your notes or not, but if they are, then great. Um, when you focus on making decisions, it's easy to manipulate uh, people to inflate your evangelistic numbers. But if you focus on making disciples, the pressure is off for an immediate decision and you can really take your time to be sure that that person truly is born again. When you focus on making decisions, you often will use impersonal methods uh, to boost numbers. But when you're making disciples, it's mostly through the context of relationship where you're going to help that person take the next step. That's what Jesus did. When you focus on making decisions, you have a tendency to rush the process that the Holy Spirit has begun in that person's life. Your goal is to get the decision. But when you focus on making disciples, you're willing to let people process the gospel until they really come to understand it and to choose to follow Jesus on their own. When you focus on making decisions, you can develop a false sense of success. We had X number of decisions, right? But when you focus on making disciples, you really have this long-term approach that really we're trying to see long-term people not only come to faith in Jesus, begin to grow in their faith and multiply their lives and the lives of others. Lastly, when you focus on making decisions, your job is not over after the decision is made. Uh, when you come to make disciples, you know that when the person makes a decision, your job has just begun. You got a baby that you got to raise and train up. And so let me tell you what I'm not saying, okay? Just for clarity. I'm not saying that you shouldn't call people to make a decision for Christ. We do that every week. Every week I present the gospel, I call people to make a decision. That's where you begin your journey, right? What I am saying is that you shouldn't call to make a decision and then that's it. You shouldn't stop there and go, well, hey, we had five decisions. Well, that's great. Then let's go on to lunch. And then you, you don't ever do anything to help that person make the next step. And I'll tell you just uh, in, in transparency, we, we are in our church right now. We're seeing a lot of decisions made. But I'm, I'm, I've got this rumble in my gut because we're having a hard time getting some of those decisions to take the next step. So we're, we're banging at how do we do this better? How do we help them to make that next step? How do we make sure they know what the next step is? How do we get a hold of those that make decisions and move them to the next stage? And that's part of the work of the ministry, right? So I'm not saying you shouldn't call for decisions. I'm just saying that uh, I come from a denomination that did kind of prided itself on seeing lots of decisions, but no follow through. And what we found is that there is a massive attrition. And churches are now scratching their heads because that's not working anymore. So Jesus calls us to make this, not just decisions, but also to make uh, disciples. And I, I just really believe this, that, that any time evangelism is kind of wrenched out of the context of a larger disciple-making strategy, it can quickly deteriorate to manipulation, gimmicks, and scrounging for decisions that seldom last. True evangelism always results in true disciples. And so we need to ask the question, are we being evangelistic? Some churches aren't even asking for decision. You know, they're not even trying to be evangelistic. But if you are, then my challenge to you is, okay, so you're seeing people come to Christ. What are you doing with them after? And that the goal is to make disciples that multiply, not just to feel like you cross the goal once they make a decision. Does that make sense? And so that was a big deal for us when I was in Oklahoma. We weren't seeing a lot of people come to faith in Jesus. Uh, what we started to realize is the more we thought outreach-minded, we started seeing more come to Christ, but then we were compelled to do something with them after we led them to the Lord. And uh, that was a major pivot point for us. So here's, uh, with that, hopefully I've stirred you up a little bit on the inside. I want you to talk about that around your table right quick. Uh, some discussion questions about how do you measure success? What is the measure of success in your church? Do you have a definition of a disciple? And what do you do with people that make decisions? How do you ensure that you're not just making decisions, but you're making disciples? Okay, take, take about five minutes to talk about that right quick. Ready, go. All right, so we've talked about um, seven bold moves, right? 
moves to transition a church to be an intentional disciple making. One is to come, not just church, church models, but Jesus is a model. Not just to make decisions, but to make disciples and be committed to making disciples. Not just be satisfied with the decisions that you make. Number three is that uh, you've got to move from programs to process. Not just doing programs for the sake of that's what we've always done, but there's actually a process that you're trying to move people through. Now, you know, most uh, parachurch, disciple-making parachurch organizations have done this. You know, they, if you look at the Navigators, uh, Campus Crusade, uh, Student Mobilization, uh, you could just name your, your favorite one. Uh, a lot of them, they think a lot about producing disciples. And what do we need to do to move people to the point of being a mature, multiplying disciple? I mean, they have staff meetings about that. They think about that. They train on that. They, they, everything is wrapped around that. But when you look at the local church, most churches that I've been a part of, grown up in, and talked to, they don't have that as their driving mission. You know, they're just busy trying, well, we, we've got prayer meeting here, and the has got that, and we've got the men's prayer breakfast, and we've got, all the, we got all these random programs, but we're not really sure if it's taking you anywhere. It's just what we do. We always do that on Tuesday night. We always do that on Thursday morning. We always do that on Sunday. You know, and, and you say, well, are these intentionally linked to move anybody? No, they're not thinking process. They're just thinking siloed programs. Does that make sense? And so when you're, when you're trying to lead a disciple-making church, you're trying to link up programs that actually move people through a process or along a pathway, if you will, of disciple making. The early church was a disciple making machine. And I just get on my little soapbox here for just a minute. Y'all will give me 30 seconds, right, to get on my soapbox. I believe that, uh, I believe that the church uh, has, has, has given, Jesus gave us the command to make disciples, right? The, the body of Christ, the church to, to make disciples. And I think many times we've sold that birthright of disciple making for the promise of church growth. And now we're realizing that it's just porridge and is wholly incapable and unable to bring about transformation in the next generation. So what has happened is we kind of thought, well, man, if we did it this way, then we would really reach a lot of people, and what we've found out is that we've been sold a bill of goods. Now, I'm not saying that everything in the church growth movement was wrong. I'm, I'm sure there are great things that we can learn and grow from and so on, but my, my point is when you stop doing the very thing Jesus told us to do, that's a problem, right? And, and the, the, the birthright of the church is disciple-making. And so what we need to do is reclaim that. That is what we do. That is who we are. This is, what, this is what our church is about, is making disciples, all right? And uh, being intentional in every regard about that. Uh, there is a difference in my mind, and I, 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 I parenthetically say in my mind, between discipleship and disciple making. So let me just make a little argument about the two, just so that you're aware of the distinctions. Discipleship is typically defined as anything that helps a person grow, anything that helps a person grow spiritually. After conversion, everything left, everything left is discipleship. This was really underscored in the recent uh, report by the Barna Group that put out a, in 2015, what it was called, the, a report called the State of Discipleship. In this report, which was commissioned by Nav Press and the Navigators and the Barna Group and several others, they surveyed 600 pastors and 2,000 believers. And uh, what they found is this. They defined discipleship this way. Discipleship is the process of growing spiritually, end quote. Therefore, discipleship is really relegated to anything that helps a person grow. So if you say, do you do discipleship at your church? Yeah. Yeah, we, we do worship services, that's discipleship. We do uh, small groups, that's discipleship. We do men's prayer breakfast, that's discipleship. We do women's Bible study, that's discipleship. We, do, we just hang out in the youth area, they just hang out, that's discipleship. Everything is discipleship. Well, let me, my argument is if everything is discipleship, then really nothing is discipleship. In the sense that Jesus didn't just do only those things. Let me, let me 
distinguish some things between discipleship, which is very generic, and disciple making, which is very specific. In uh, discipleship, it's really a part of a process. In other words, what they'll say is, yeah, discipleship comes after you give your life to Christ, you come to Christ, then you do discipleship, and you do that for the rest of your life. Uh, There's no really end to it. Where disciple making is about, uh, it begins in evangelism, you're trained, and it ends in multiplication. There's a big difference between the two. Discipleship is kind of a part of the process. Disciple making is the whole thing. Evangelism, uh, connecting, uh, training up, sending out, and mobilizing and multiplying. Uh, secondly, discipleship usually doesn't have an end in mind. You just do discipleship and you do Bible study after 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 Bible study. Whereas disciple, disciple making has a very clear end in mind is I'm going to train you to multiply your life in the life of another person, which is very distinctive. Third, discipleship usually is heavily knowledge-based. I'm going to train you in discipleship. We learn a lot of things. So we, we learn a lot of Bible. We learn a lot of theology. We learn a lot of church history. We learn a lot of things, and those are all good. But disciple making is more practice-based in the sense that I'm going to train you how to pray. I'm going to train you how to lead someone to Christ. I'm going to train you how to do certain things. These competencies we talked about, how to lead, how to start a group, how to multiply your life. I'm going to train you how to do it and then watch you do it, actually do it. See, in, under this discipleship umbrella, you can just sit and take in, but never do anything, which is what a lot of our churches do, right? We, we, we know a whole lot more than we ever practice, right? But disciple making requires you to get out and actually put it into practice with accountability and so on. Fourthly, discipleship usually ends when the Bible study is complete, but disciple making is focused on multiplication to the third and fourth generation. Jesus was intentionally training men to multiply. And so, therefore, uh, I I don't really like the word necessarily discipleship. I have great friends that use it all the time, so they know my position on this. I really prefer the word disciple making because it clarifies what we're doing from beginning to end. All right? So with that definition in mind, how did Jesus do, make a disciple? When I say disciple making is a process, what do I mean? Well, when you go back to the Great Commission, back to the Great Commission, all authority of heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. That's the, that's the product, right? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Jesus has one command, and that is make disciples. But he gives... He gives four uh, phrases, if you will, participle phrases that, that, that show us how to do it. Shows us what the pathway is, what the process is. Now, I'll give you the first one. The first one is, he says, go. Or as you are going, literally, as you are going. So it's an ongoing uh, process. So that's one part of Disciple making, it starts with somebody going, right? Somebody in motion, somebody going out. Uh, Jesus was a friend of sinners, and so he said, you're to go and to share the gospel with people that don't know Christ. So that's the first phase. The next phrase he said was what? What was the other, the other word? Baptize, all right, baptizing. I'll just put baptize here, okay? So baptism, obviously he's referring here to water baptism, uh, baptism was really all about two things. It was about identifying with Jesus publicly and inclusion into the body of Christ, inclusion into a body of believers, a group of believers. That's what baptism is really about, identification and inclusion. And so when he says baptize, this was an idea that you're going to baptize them as, as a rite, if you will, Uh, into publicly declaring your faith in Jesus and then joining a community of baptized believers, right? Uh, That's that's what baptism was all about. So uh, going was all about going out and sharing the gospel. Baptism is what you did with them once you won them to Christ. So I'm going to put a little 
cross right here just to kind of identify the faith line, if you will. That when someone moves from going, they're hearing the gospel, now they're baptized, they've crossed over a faith line that is they've given their life to Christ, right? And now they're being baptized and included into, uh, into the body. Well, what happens after that? Well, what does he say here? What do we do with them afterwards? What's the next phrase? Teaching them to what? Observe. Or teaching them other versions, they teach them to obey. Ha ha. There you go. Now, most of the time, we like to just say teaching. And we miss it. We're teaching them to obey. We've got to put the emphasis on the right syllable or the emphasis on the right syllable. Right? What I mean by that is it's not teaching them to obey, but it's teaching them to obey. The, the goal is obedience. The goal, this is, this is the training phase. So I'm going to put uh, teaching to, and then obey really big. All right? That's the end goal. I'm not just teaching you ad nauseum until you know everything, but you don't do anything. All right, that's what I have a problem with our church, right? As I'm teaching them, <laughs> there's not a whole lot of doing with that. And so we have to teach them to obey. So how do you do that? How do you teach a child to obey? Well, you, you instruct them, you show them how, you correct, rebuke, train. Does that sound familiar to any verse, you know, that we know? Word of God is uh, living and active, you know, and it, it, it is the source of teaching, correcting, and training in righteousness, so the man of God may be fully equipped for every good work. And so this is the idea of training and equipping for obedience. This is the equipping training. It's going to have some accountability to it, some teeth to it, right, to help that person grow and obey. And then the last phrase is actually implied, all right? I, I like to put a little question mark here because it's kind of, it's implied, though not overtly stated. He said, I want you to go share the gospel with unbelievers. I want you to baptize those that are believers, including them, identifying with Jesus, include them into the body of Christ. And then I want you to teach those new believers how to obey the Lord Jesus so they're conformed to his likeness. And then he said, um, teach them to obey all I've commanded you. Now, what did he just command them to do in this verse? Go and make disciples, right? So the implication here is to multiply. So they're going, to, they're going to multiply themselves by teaching. They're going and, and including others and then training them to obey. And they're going to do the same thing with others. So the implication clearly here is multiplication. And his great promise, if we will do this, is what? His promise is, I will be with you. Isn't that a beautiful promise? He said, I will be with you. Now, listen, here's the cool thing. I... I I can spend four hours just on this. Trust me, I'm not going to do that today. But let me just give you a little, just, just wet your appetite just a little bit for, I know mean, you're already hungry, all right? So let me just stir up some spiritual hunger here. If you were to overlay the life of Christ, the three and a half, three and three quarter years, that's debated how actually long the ministry of Jesus was. If you were to overlay that onto this grid, what you would find is that Jesus' ministry actually laid out in these four phases. That Jesus was moving people from one phase to the next phase to the next phase all the way through. In fact, you have a handout in your, in your packet that is a, a copy of our, what is in the book there. And it shows uh, some phases. Anybody? Yeah, there you go. That, that thing right there. Can you hold that up so everybody can see that? There you go. It looks like that. All right. And this four-step process is exactly what Jesus did. For example, the, uh, I, in our church, what we've done is we've come back and we have uh, titled these four phases something like this. Uh, explore, connect, grow, and multiply. Okay? And what we're saying is that these are the four phases that you would take one uh, to actually grow them into. It. So this is the pathway. This is how disciples are made. That's what Jesus did. In the first uh, 
The first phase here often is identified by the phrase, come and see. You see this in Jesus' ministry. Come and see. In John chapter 1, verse 39, uh, Jesus has just been identified. Remember, John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And then these guys trail after him. And he says, What do you want? And he said, Come and see. Come and see. That was Andrew and John. And then after Andrew and John came and saw Jesus, they were convinced. Andrew goes and gets who? His, his brother, yeah, Peter. And then uh, Peter, he changed, Jesus gives him a nickname, all right? Cephas, so I'm going to call you Peter, da, da, da. And then all of a sudden, they're fine. Then they start headed back to Bethsaida, where they're from, and they run into Philip, right? And Jesus calls Philip to come. And then Philip goes and gets Nathaniel, remember? And Nathaniel said, what good could come out of Nazareth? And he says, just come and see. Come and see. That's the starting five, just like a basketball team. That was Jesus' first starting five. He takes him to Cana, where he turns water into wine. He brings them all the way down to Jerusalem, where they encounter Nicodemus at night. They go straight up the gut through Samaria, a place where it really shouldn't have been. But Jesus led them there, made them very uncomfortable. But there he encounters a woman at a well, and she leaves Jesus to run back into town. And she says, come and see this man who told me everything I ever did. Back up uh, to uh, Capernaum, and Jesus again encounters uh, people in Cana. But my point is that all the way through here, Jesus is saying, come and see. And people are coming and seeing critics and skeptics, believers, seekers, all of them are coming to taste and see who Jesus is. And by the way, this lasted about 18 months 18 months of Jesus' ministry, we would say, is in the come and see phase of his ministry. The next phase of ministry uh, is what we call what, what we call the follow me phase. And this is found in Matthew 4, 18 and 19. And this is, of course, after 18 months of ministry, Jesus comes and walks by the Sea of Galilee. Peter and Andrew are fishing. James and John are fishing. And Jesus says... Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. In other words, let me just, you're going to spend your whole life just catching fish? Man, i got bigger plans for you than that. We're going to catch men, right? We're going to be at work at that. And it says that they dropped their nets and immediately followed him. Now, have you ever read that and wondered, why is it that they just, they didn't even know this guy? Oh, yeah, they did. They've been with him for 18 months. They've been with him for 18 months, listening to Jesus. But now all of a sudden, now they realize that he's calling them for commitment. And this dropping your nets, walking away from your income, walking away from your dad's business, walking away from, from that expectation to follow the rabbi was a huge commitment. But what they did was they connected with Jesus there. They connected with each other. They connected with the ministry of Jesus. They were identifying with Jesus publicly, and they were becoming the Jesus men, the Jesus community, the Jesus guys. And all of that happens right here. In this phase, this goes on for another six months. During that six-month period of time, uh, Jesus leads them on what Spader likes to call six fishing trips uh, where, where they minister to the, the leper, the, uh, the, the lame guy that comes to the ceiling and the, the leper that's sick and, the, and Peter's uh, mother-in-law that's sick and all the whole crowd comes and Jesus ministers to them. They're not really doing anything. They're just shadowing Jesus, right? They're shadowing. I'm just going to write that over here. They're shadowing Jesus, but they are participating, and they're included. They're experiencing community. They're, I'm just going to put they're connecting to Jesus. They're connecting to each other. They're connecting to the cause, right? All that is happening in this phase right here. Then after uh, about six months, Uh, Jesus moves them over to another stage. And this other stage happens in Mark 3, 13, and 14. This is where Jesus, by the way, this is about the two-year mark. If you're adding it up, this is about the two-year mark. By the way, most churches stop right here. If we can just get people to explore the claims of Christ, get saved, and come and be a part of the church and maybe get involved, we've won. High five, chest bump, game over, score. And if we'll keep them around, then our church attendance will grow, right? And then maybe they'll give even better. 
And then we won. But we're missing the whole back half of what Jesus did. They're only in the first two stages. The third stage is in Mark 3.13 where Jesus spent all night praying. And he called 12 to come to him. That they might be with him. So we call this the be with me phase. The be with me phase. And then at that point, Jesus calls the 12 to be with him. And this is really Jesus' boot camp. For the next six months, at least, Jesus is training, 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 training. You're going to find in Luke 8, Jesus goes on a tour with them and leads them. Then in Luke 9, he sends them out two by two, and they come back and report. You're going to find in Luke 10, they finally start to multiply again. I don't want to get there yet, but that's exactly what happens. He's demonstrating his power over elements, natural elements, death, demons, all of that. He's showing them how to act like he acts, talk like he talks, walk like he walks. This is his training. I'm just going to put equip. He's equipping them. He's training them. Luke 6 says, a, a person is not above his master, but when he is fully trained, he'll be like his master. This is what they're learning to do. They're being equipped and trained for the work of that ministry. It's very intentional training. I believe it's there that he trained them to walk with God, reach their world, and invest in a few in a very intentional way. Think about, think about guys that are going into service. We already talked about people that are in service, right? Let's say they, they're checking out the military. They finally join up. Then you join the military, and guess what? They give you free housing. They give you a free haircut. They give you free meals. You get to all dress alike, act alike, talk alike. You're definitely experiencing community together, right? But they don't say, okay, now that you got your new uniforms and you all look alike, talk alike, experience community, go out there and get them, boys. No, they don't do that. What do they do? They train, 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 and train some more because they know that if they don't train you, you're going to get killed out there, right? So that's what Jesus did. This is Jesus' boot camp. He's training, training, training them. And then lastly, after about six, another six-month period of time, you have the last phase, what we call the multiply phase. You see this in Luke 9, 23. Uh, you also see it in John 15, but I, I kind of draw the line at Luke 9, 23, when Jesus said, uh, he said, if anyone will come after me, then deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. And that's a pivot point because he's up in Caesarea Philippi at that point. And for that point there, he begins to move toward Jerusalem. And the Bible says he set his face like a flint toward Jerusalem. All of his, all that pivot from the Mount of Transfiguration beyond, it's all about him focused on the cross. Remember, Mount of Transfiguration, Elijah and Moses show up, remember? And they're talking about his departure. It's all about the cross. And Jesus talks more after Luke 9, 23 about suffering, sacrifice, and self-denial than any other place. This is where you get the, all the statements about if you do not hate your mother and father and so on, you're not worthy of me. And if you don't, you know, all these hard statements of discipleship come from, are mostly found, not all exclusively, but mostly found in this phase. So Jesus talks about suffering. He talks about sacrifice. He talks about self-denial. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains a single seed. But if it does die, it produces many seeds. That whole idea of dying for multiplication comes to bear. And guess what happens? During this phase, the 12 began to turn into 72. Now all of a sudden, 72 are multiplying. And Luke uh, 10, 21, I believe it is, it says that Jesus was filled with joy. Well, why is Jesus filled with joy? Because they come back and they say, now the 12 and the 72, now the 72 are coming back and they're saying, the demons are subject to us and we're seeing people saved and Jesus is filled with joy. Why? Because he sees multiplication happen to the fourth generation from Jesus to the 12 to the 72 to the others now. Fourth generation multiplication is happening right here. I'm going to put fourth gen right here. That's what's happening. That's why in, in uh, John 17, verse 3, when he said, Father, I've glorified you on the earth by accomplishing all that you asked me to do. Well, he hadn't gone to the cross yet. What, what, what work has he accomplished? Well, it was a work of training up disciples that would multiply their lives into others. That's what he did. So this uh, lasts about roughly nine months, and then you see them, he then him head to the cross, and you see Pentecost 
and you see the explosion of the church. My point is this, that when you, uh, when you look at how Jesus told us to make disciples, but he also told us how to do it. You've got to be able to, at some point, go out and share the gospel with people that need Christ. You've got to move them into a place where they can connect with Jesus, connect in community with other believers, connect with the cause of Christ and get involved and start serving. Then you take those and you move them into a phase where you equip them and train them on how to walk with God, how to reach a world, how to invest in a few. And then out of those, those become the leaders that will multiply. You multiply your church to the third and fourth generation. You multiply through personal multiplication. Well, we'll get into that later on today. Multiply in lots of different ways. So this is really the, the pathway for how to make disciples. So what you want to do is you want to be sure that your, uh, your programming fits into this pathway. Are you moving people from point A to point B? Are you moving people from exploring, coming to faith, connecting, getting involved, being trained how to feed themselves and multiply, and then sending them out to do it? That's how you make disciples in the context of a local church. This is what we do at our church, and this is what churches do across the country that are making disciples effectively. All right, now we're going to stop right there for just a minute because it's time to eat. We need to eat something, all right? Your brain is probably getting saturated right now, so we're going to give it a break for just a few minutes. But before we go to lunch, uh, I want you to just take a moment to talk uh, around the table just a second of those last little discussion questions. What are your thoughts about this process? What part of this process do you think your church is strong in? And what part of the process do you think you've got some work to do? All right? Maybe your church is really good at sharing the gospel, but not really good at connecting those new believers or training them up or multiplying. Just think about your church, the health of your church. What are they good at? What parts of these phases are, are not quite formed yet? Okay? Talk about that around your table, and then we'll break uh, for lunch in just a second. Ready? Go. Go.